Ephesians 4, 11 to 15 says, And he, Christ, himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Who's that? Into Christ. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. One more here, Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests but also for the interests of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? In Christ Jesus. And there's many more passages I could read to you this morning, but I think these three make it clear. What is, or I should say, what should be the ultimate desire of every true follower of Jesus Christ? According to God's word, what is the ultimate desire of every genuine Christian? It's to be like Christ. Because followers of Jesus want to be like the one they're following. Disciples of Jesus want to be like their Lord. Servants of Jesus want to be like their Master. And as disciples of Jesus, which the majority of us here this morning are... We want to be like Jesus in every single possible way, don't we? Right? There's not some area of life to say, I want to be like Jesus here, but, but not really like here. We want to live the way Jesus lives. We want to pray the way Jesus prays. We want to love the same things that Jesus loves. And we want to think the same way that Jesus thinks, don't we? Which means that our desire to be like Jesus must lead us to want to think the same way that Jesus does about everything, including what we'll talk about this morning, including our wealth. Inevitably, we as, desire, as disciples of Jesus today are going to have this world's wealth pass through our fingers. All right? How many of you signed a check this last week? How many of you paid a bill? And hopefully most of you are like me. It's like, I don't like paying bills. <laughs> we don't. But the question that we're dealing with this morning is also the same question we began dealing with last Sunday. It's the question of how must the disciple of Jesus view the wealth that he or she possesses? What must we do with it? How are we to use it? As followers of Jesus, what is our relationship to the wealth that we possess in this life? And as we return to our text that we looked at last Sunday, Luke 16, and if you haven't turned there, I'd like you to turn there. We actually see a very good clue that Jesus gives to us about our relationship to wealth. So, so if you are there in Luke 16, let's just briefly review the, some of the scriptures that we saw last Sunday. We saw verses 1 through 9 last Sunday. And let's see if we can remember some of the main characters from that parable. Right, there were two main characters. The first one that we see mentioned in verse 1 is who? It's a rich man. Right? This is the master of the parable. Who's the second one that is mentioned? 
It's a steward or, or a manager, depending on your translation. Which character do you think Jesus is going to use to help us understand our relationship to wealth? Is our relationship to wealth something that is that of ownership, like the master? Or is our relationship to wealth supposed to be that of stewardship? Well, you probably know the answer, but I'll let you think about it as we continue on. But first, Jesus wanted to teach his disciples something else through this parable, which we learned last Sunday. You remember this? A very unusual passage, an unusual truth. And we saw that truth in verse 9. Jesus said in verse 9, I say to you, right, remembering what we read about the, the parable here, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon or unrighteous wealth, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. A very unusual verse. This wealth that we have in our possession, the, the same kind of wealth, Jesus calls it unrighteous wealth, unrighteous mammon. In other words, it's the same kind of wealth that has potential to accomplish all manner of evil in this world. Jesus is saying, put it to good use by making eternal friends. Use the wealth that you have to make friends with God. Now, I know that language sounds strange, especially if you weren't here last Sunday. In fact, it almost sounds like Jesus is saying we can use our wealth to bribe our way into heaven. Is that what Jesus is saying? You come here every Sunday and you put enough money in the offering plate and God's going to say, hey, you put a lot of money in the offering plate while you were on earth, so we're going to let you into heaven. That's not how God works. And that's not what Jesus is saying. Because if you compare what Jesus is saying here with other scripture, we know that it's impossible to bribe God. I mean, we see in the law of Moses, right, that God gives to his people in Deuteronomy 10, 12. It says, the Lord our God is God of gods. He is Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. You can't bribe God to get your way into hell. Not through your wealth, not through your good works, through nothing. So we can't take what Jesus is saying that way. And the reality is, the people Jesus is telling this parable to wouldn't have taken it that way either. Look back in verse 1. Remember, who is Jesus telling this parable to? Who is he telling it to? He's telling it to his disciples. Right? These are people who are already committed to following Jesus. These are people who have already embraced the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom of God. So with this parable, Jesus is just continuing to help his disciples understand more clearly what the lives of people on their way to the kingdom of God are going to look like. Right? They've learned a lot, and we've seen a lot in Luke's gospel, right? <laughs> Jesus says, live this way, no one else lives this way, but my followers live this way. Right? Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you if people uh, mock you, if they exclude you, if they hate you for my sake. Rejoice and leap for joy in that day. Why? Because your reward is great in heaven. Right? That's not normal thinking for people in this world. But that is the way of life for the disciple of Jesus. And so here Jesus is saying just another way. He's teaching them just another way of what living for Jesus looks like. Of what someone who's on their way to the kingdom of God lives like. You know, their faith is already in Jesus Christ as their Lord, isn't it? Right? You remember back in Luke chapter 9, Peter has already declared, you are the Christ of God. Let me ask you, and we're just getting into the thinking here behind you know, why Jesus is bringing them through this process. When you first repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and Savior of your soul, 
How many of you automatically knew everything there was to know about being a disciple of Jesus? I don't see any hands raised. I wonder why. Because that's not how Jesus works. I mean, how many of you received a divine download into your brain that began making you follow Jesus in every way possible? That's not how it happens. I mean, learning to follow Jesus is a process, isn't it? I mean, you know this if you've raised kids. They don't come out of the womb and automatically drive a car. At least you don't want them to. They don't automatically be born and can go and, and pay bills and go and get a job and make adult decisions. They can't do that. It's not capable of them. I mean, the moment you repented of your sin and you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you were born again. Right? That's what Jesus says there in John chapter 3. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what happens to new disciples of Jesus Christ. They are born again. They are made a new creation. But there's something we have to remind ourselves about ourselves. That means we are a spiritual baby at that moment. Right? We have been exposed now once and for all to a whole new way of life that we're just beginning. And just like a little baby has to learn how to walk and learn how to talk and learn how to brush his teeth, learn how to hold its own baby bottle, same too with the Christian. The Christian needs to take baby steps, right? You don't give a, a, a baby a hunk of meat right after it's born and say, eat this, here's your meal. He needs milk. And friends, you and I, when we first are born again, we need the simplicity, the simplicity of God's word. We need, we need to, to know what it's like to follow Jesus. And we need to grow in this little by little. And Jesus is helping his disciples grow little by little in their understanding of what it means to follow him. And so they have been learning this. Right? All through Luke's gospel, right? From basically Luke chapter 6 all the way up to this point, we've seen Jesus taking his disciples by the hand and saying, this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to follow Jesus. I right, put those together. All right. Now this is what it means to follow Jesus. Add that to it. This is what it means. So you see how it works. They've been learning what following Jesus really looks like. They've been learning how much it will cost to follow Jesus. They've been learning the price that they must pay to follow Jesus. And friends, this is something just to remind us of that Jesus has already taught. Following Jesus will cost you. Because Jesus is not only a friend of sinners, though he is. Jesus is not only an example for us to follow, though he is. Jesus is all those things. But Jesus Christ is also Lord. He is Lord. What does the word Lord mean? It means he has authority over our lives. He has the authority to demand our complete allegiance. And he has the authority to command our complete affection. And so when Jesus teaches his disciples now that their wealth must be used to make eternal friends, they are learning yet one more area in their life that must fall under his lordship. Jesus is not telling his disciples to bribe God to letting them into heaven. Jesus is saying that as his followers, they must also declare their friendship to God by using their wealth the same way that they've already been using the words. Right? Like we said last Sunday, their wealth needs to back up what their mouth is saying. That's how you know they're truly following Jesus. And that's how we know that we're truly following Jesus. Which brings us back to our opening question. What is our relationship to the wealth that we possess in this life? Are we the master of it? Or are we the steward of it? Let's continue reading on in verse 10. And we'll get into this. Jesus continues saying here in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, he says, 
He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. I think you're starting to see the answer, right? Is this verse talking about the conduct of someone who is master over wealth? Or is this verse talking about the conduct of a steward? It's talking about the conduct of a steward, right? The conduct of the steward in the parable is what Jesus is using to teach his disciples something here. And what Jesus is getting at here in verse 10 is that his disciples are also stewards. And there are two possible ways that a steward can conduct himself, can't he? One way that Jesus says a steward can conduct himself is faithfully. Right, you see it there in verse 10. He who is faithful. Or a steward can conduct himself another way. And Jesus says here, unjustly. There's faithfully, unfaithfully. Justly and unjustly. Those are the two possible options available to the steward. And notice what Jesus also says here in verse 10. He says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So if a person is being responsible, or using the words of Jesus here, is being faithful with something that is of relatively little importance, What's going to be true of him when he is given something to take care of, of greater importance? How is he going to handle it? If he's going to take care of something that's pretty insignificant, right? For example, I know my brother Craig, I used to cut grass for brother Craig. If we're able to cut a little piece, a little piece of grass, a little yard, and do it well, Christ is going to be more lenient and more, more desirable to give someone a bigger piece of grass to cut, right? Or if you can handle a small walking mower and you're going to take care of that, you're going to take care of a riding lawnmower. On the other hand, if a person is unjust with something of little importance, you can count on him to be unjust with something of great importance. I want to give one more illustration, perhaps from the... Uh, the area of real estate. Some of you have dealt in real estate. Um, how many of you have, uh, have ever dealt in renting out houses? Some of you. How many of you have ever rented houses? Or in apartments? All right, so, so there, whether you're on the, on the one end or the other end, you, you know what we're talking about. If you rent out a house, what kind of person do you want to be your renter? I mean, you want someone who's gonna take care of the house they're renting from you, right? You want someone who takes a level of ownership, even though they realize that they don't actually own the house. You want someone who's going to regularly mow the grass, who's going to clean the bathrooms, who's going to protect the wood floors and take care of any damages that they might cause out of their own pockets. That's the best kind of renter, right? Someone who takes responsibility for how they treat the house that they're renting. In fact, if that renter takes care of a house that doesn't actually belong to him, you know that when he does receive his own house, when he does save up enough money and buy his own place, what kind of person is he going to be with his own house? He's going to be the same kind of person that's going to take care of his own house, isn't he? Because it's, it, it's not the, the, the thing that you give him, it's the person who's taking care of it. It's the character of the person who's, who, who's renting and then owning. But too often we hear horror stories about renters who essentially trash the house that they're renting, don't we? They carve grooves in the floorboards as they slide furniture back and forth. They let kids color all over the walls. They let their pets chew on the railing and tear on the carpet. And who cares? It's not their house. Why should they take care of it? So if that's the way that they treat a house that doesn't belong to them, 
Do you think that things are going to suddenly change if they happen to get a house of their own? I don't think so. In fact, the point that Jesus is making is, no, they won't. A person who is faithful in what is least, what is insignificant, is faithful also in what is more significant and much. A person who is unjust in what is least or insignificant is unjust also in much. And this holds true when it comes to the use of the money we possess. That's where Jesus is going here in the next verse. We are to be God's stewards of the wealth that we possess in this life. We are to be caretakers of the wealth that we possess in this life on God's behalf. So what if you have not been faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to you? What does Jesus say in verse 11? He says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, right? The unrighteous wealth, the wealth of this world that can be put to all kinds of evil uses. If you've not been faithful with that, who will commit to your trust the true riches? You know what Jesus is talking about by true riches, right? Eternal riches. Riches that will last forever. If we don't take care and steward well and be faithful with the, the, the physical, temporary resources that we have right now, why would God entrust us with something far, far more significant in the life to come? Compared to the true riches of the kingdom of God, the wealth that we possess in this life is of extremely little significance. And friends, we need to learn to have an eternal perspective when we look at the wealth that we have in our possession. The wealth of this world is temporary. The wealth of this world can be lost. It can be stolen. You can be scammed out of it. The government can come along and just seize it at will. Maybe we're not there yet, but maybe one day we will be. And when we die, as we, we talked about last Sunday, the wealth that we have accumulated is going to belong to someone else because you can't take it with you. You never see a U-Haul going behind a hearse, do you? But what about the kingdom of God? What about those riches? Those riches will last forever. That is a treasure that can never be stolen. That is a reward that can never be lost. And that's why Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Where moth and rust corrupts, right, damages it. And where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can't even begin to compare the significance of the two. It's no contest whatsoever. But there is enough significance to this world's wealth to reveal the heart of the one who possesses it. And let's not miss a very important detail from the parable. Right, we see what the unjust steward did, remember? He was wasting his master's possessions. Master calls him in and says, you're fired. You go and get the, the account of your dealings because you can't be my steward anymore. So he goes and he calls you know, different debtors of his master and says, hey, let me change your bill and make it cheaper for you so that when I get fired, you'll take me into your home. And so he squanders more of his master's wealth that way. So the point is, this steward is not using his own wealth to make friends, is he? Right? He doesn't go out and just start you know, handing out his own money. Whose wealth is he using, or should we say misusing, to make friends for when he loses his job? He's using his master's wealth. He is being unjust with the resources that were entrusted to him. 
He is being unfaithful, unrighteous. Friends, you and I need to recognize who our wealth truly belongs to. And when we do, use it for his will instead of our own. If our wealth is truly not ours, as Jesus is saying, if our wealth truly belongs to God, and he has made us stewards over it, that is going to fundamentally change the way that we view and the way that we use the wealth in our possession. It has to. It means every time we go to the store, what goes through our mind? This is God's money. Every time we hop on Amazon, what goes through our mind? This is God's money. Every time we pay our bills, whatever bills for, what goes through our mind? This is God's money. Because I think we, we know this. You just step out the door and you, you look at your neighbor's driveway or you look in your neighbor's garage or your neighbor, a neighbor invites you to her home and you look around their house. I mean, most people see the wealth and their bank accounts and their IRAs and their 401ks as money reserved for their own self-benefit and their own self-pleasure. Isn't that the case? They see the wealth in their possession and they say to themselves, that's mine. That's for me. It's for my comfort. It's for my convenience. It's for my own interests. But when a person comes to genuine faith in Jesus as the Lord of his life, what does Lord mean? It means master. It means authority. It means ownership. He will look at his bank account in his IRA and his 401k, and he will view the wealth in his possession in a completely different way. When he sees what he has, when he sees what has been given to him, he says, this is the Lord's. This ultimately is not mine. This must be used for his purposes. This must be viewed as a resource for accomplishing his will. And God does not leave us wondering how we ought to steward the resources he has entrusted to us. All right? I mean, you might ask yourself, okay, so, so how do I be faithful with God's money? If it is God's money, if it is God's wealth, right, we have to come with a cross over that hurdle first. But once we have, we come on the other side and say, okay, Lord, I accept what you say here. Jesus, I accept what you say. This is not mine. This is yours. I'm a steward over it. So how can I be faithful with it? And I think that's where most of us are. Some of us are wrestling with, no, no, this is mine. At least I've been living like it's mine. Some of us are there and we have to overcome that first hurdle of saying, no, this is God's. But for most of us who have already passed that point, we say, no, this is God's. What do we do with it? Where do we turn to know what the will of God is for our lives concerning our money? And when we look at the Bible, we see all kinds of ways that we can be faithful with the resources that God has given to us. Let's look at a few passages, and, and, and hopefully this will help you get started in knowing how to be faithful, using God's resources for His will, for the kinds of things that please Him, that align with His way of thinking. Turn first of all to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. One way of being faithful with the resources God has entrusted to us, we see here in 1 Corinthians 9, is to provide for those who labor for our spiritual welfare. Look at what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 7. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Paul says, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? 
Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? And then go ahead and hop down to verse 14. It says, Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Now, that might sound kind of complicated, but let me simplify it here. This is probably what most people are familiar with when you put money in the offering. When you put money in the offering plate, of course it goes to taking care of the building, uh, paying the bills for the building that we meet in. Uh, but also the money that God's people gives goes to the providing of the living of their pastor. And I tell you what, my family is greatly encouraged by that. In any church that you join, any church that you're a member of, the same thing holds true. These are men who have given their lives to the shepherding of the flock. And that's one way we can be faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to us. That's one way to carry out God's will with the wealth that has been provided. Another passage here, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Another way of being faithful with the resources God has entrusted to us is to provide for our families. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 says, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith. And is worse than an unbeliever. In other words, if, if you're not using your wealth to provide for your family, right? If you're not nourishing your family with, 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 with appropriate food, if you're not clothing them with appropriate clothing, and this is Michigan, they, they need appropriate clothing in the wintertime especially. If you're not caring for your family, and, and usually that comes in the means of our wealth, and you're not being faithful to the wealth that God has entrusted to you. One more passage here this morning. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This might be one that many in the church wrestle with or even overlook. Because we are very independent people, aren't we? We're like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of myself. I'm going to look to my own interests. I'm going to you know, do what, what benefits number one. But here in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we see a third way of being faithful with the resources God has entrusted to us is to provide for needy brothers and sisters in Christ. It says here, by this we know love, that he, who's he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Right? These, are, these are believing followers of Jesus Christ, who are spiritual brothers and sisters, part of the family of God. Verse 17 says, but whoever has this world's goods, right, wealth constitutes as that. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, what's the reality? How does the love of God abide in him? In other words, it doesn't. I want to add a little more weight to this last one, because I think this is where many of God's people struggle. Turn back just a few pages to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 14. It 
says here, James chapter 2, verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? And Jesus makes a big deal about this in John chapter 15, right? If you have faith, genuine faith, then it's going to be fleshed out in the way that you live your life. So Jesus says, or the Apostle James says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith, or literally, can that kind of faith save him? A kind of faith that does not also have works proceeding from that faith. Not saying works plus faith, but works that are the fruit of faith. Verse 15 says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In other words, if you see or know of a believing brother or sister who is in need, and you have the finances and the resources to meet that need, but you don't, then you are not being faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to you. Do you see what the will of God is? Right? And these are just three areas. I mean, there's other things that Jesus has already said in Luke's Gospel think if you want to write down a passage look at Luke chapter 6 see what Jesus says about money you'll be surprised but it's the will of God but we don't have to wonder how we ought to use our resources faithfully because God makes it clear a number of ways how we do that so when people are not being faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to them it's because there's going to be another problem. When people are not being faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted them, it's because, and here's the reality for most people, they have made wealth, or what wealth can buy, into something that it shouldn't be. They have made wealth their master instead of God. Turn with me back to Luke 16, and this is where Jesus concludes and where we'll conclude today. Jesus says in verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You cannot serve God and wealth. You can't love God and love money too. You can't live your life prioritizing God and also live your life prioritizing the dollar. You can't have God as your Lord and Master and also money as your Lord and Master. Does that make sense? Whether or not that's easy to take in, does that make sense? Is there any question about what Jesus is teaching his disciples here? My friend, if God, and therefore his son Jesus, is not the Lord and master of your life, it's because something else is. And for the vast majority of Christians, or I should say the vast majority of Americans, maybe some Christians, you can probably start by looking at their bank accounts. You can start by looking at their credit card bills. For most people living around us and working with us, the almighty dollar is their Lord. It's the dollar that decides their job. It's the dollar that decides in what state they live. It's the dollar that decides their day-to-day -day action and decisions. For most people, wealth is their God. Even if they've never thought about it that way. But can wealth be the master 
of the Christian. Is it possible for wealth to be the Lord of the disciple of Jesus Christ? It can't. It is not possible. You cannot serve God and wealth. If wealth is your Lord, then God is not. And if God through his son Jesus is not your Lord, then here's the weighty reality. You don't belong to him. The true disciple of Jesus will, he must be faithful with the unrighteous wealth, the wealth of the world, which we see even in this passage, how it can be used to evil purposes. It can become your God. It can become your master so easily. It can become the thing that dictates the choices and decisions you make in your life. The true disciple of Jesus must be faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to him here in this life. If you're not faithful with the unrighteous wealth of this life, if you're not responsible in this life with the world's temporary resources in your possession, it is a guarantee that you won't be faithful with the riches of eternal life. It is. Things won't change. If so happen, you end up in heaven. If you're not faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to you in this life, it is a guarantee that God will not reward you with your own wealth in the life to come. A true disciple of Jesus will be faithful with the wealth that God has entrusted to him. He will treat the wealth and the resources in his possession like it all be belongs to God. You know why? Because it does. So do you understand what your relationship to the wealth in your possession is? Do you see it from the words of Jesus? If you're a true follower of Jesus, then God has made you his steward. He's made you his caretaker. And if God has given you the responsibility to use the temporary wealth of this world according to the will of your master, and if you are faithfully stewarding for God the temporary, fleeting, insignificant wealth that he has entrusted to you in this life, he will surely entrust you with the true, enduring wealth in the life to come. And you can take Jesus at his word. The exchange will be eternally worth it. Do you believe that this morning? I pray that you do. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you that whatever your word says it is true and we can trust it and Lord there are things in your word that we might hear that causes angst in our soul that might even cause us to initially recoil from it but Lord when we recover from our surprise Help us come back once again and reread what we have just read and realize the full weight and the significance of the words that you have said. And Father, I pray that you would draw all who are in this room to the truth of what you have said, that we indeed would begin seeing ourselves as your stewards of your wealth and not masters of our own. And I pray you'd help us to see ourselves the way you see us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.